My name is Ray Eisen, and it is my uh, privilege to introduce Dr. Julian Corner to deliver a talk entitled Systems Thinking and Social Justice. Can I also welcome Barbara Schmidt Abbey, a doctoral student with the ASTIC group, who will deliver the vote of thanks and assist with the Q&A session. Like Julian, Barbara is an alumnus of our OU STIP postgraduate program. Julian, already with a PhD in English literature and the CEO of the UK-based foundation, Van Kelly Chase, since 2011, made time to complete a PG certificate in STIP in the early 20 teens. Since then, he has been actively using his OU experience to effect change within his own organization. Van Kelly Chase is a unique organization with a unique mission. At the risk of duplicating what Julian might say, I'd like to read their vision and mission statement to you. We are striving for a world healed by justice, equity and inclusion, a world where all people can live with dignity and opportunity in supportive communities. Our mission is to challenge injustice and create the conditions for much healthier systems to emerge. We have a particular focus on those systems that result in the mental distress, violence and destitution experienced by people who are subject to marginalization in the UK. Within Lancaster Chase, Julian describes his role as to provide leadership of the organization and accountability to our board of trustees to bring together several priorities, our mission, values and strategy, our governance model, external influence, our investment approach and our commitment to climate equity and justice. At Lang Kelly Chase, he has conceived and led several systemic change initiatives, including a governance action inquiry and an approach to working with complexity. Under Julian's guidance and in collaboration with his colleagues and key stakeholders, Van Kelly Chase has strived to become an organization that walks its talk. His presentation today continues and strives to make sense of one of his ongoing systemic co-inquiries. How can systems thinking better contribute to affecting social justice? I give you Julian Corner. Thank you, Ray. Um, and um, thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm um, flattered and honored. Um, having completed only um, two modules, uh, I didn't expect this honor. So um, thank you for that. And thank you to everyone who is joining today or who is uh, watching after the event. Um, I will try and justify the time you've given over for this. Um, I'm very glad that um, Ray has, has already indicated that, although I'm billed as a Dr. Julian Corner, I definitely don't have a doctorate in systems thinking as will become quickly apparent. Um, my PhD was on George Eliot, who herself was something of a systems thinker. She loved a web metaphor. So um, I, I take some inspiration from her. Um, so I'm going to move to um, my presentation and share my screen and hope that this works. Um, let me see. Apologies for the violent yellow colour, it will go soon. Um, so yes, I should say um, a little bit about Lankelly Chase before I start, because uh, I'm sure many of you are not familiar with us or our work. Uh, Lankelly Chase is a philanthropic funder in the UK. We are 60 years old, nearly, and um, our endowment from which we draw our income um, comes from uh, a fortune that was uh, created by property development uh, in the 50s and 60s. Um, we have increasingly over the years focused on social justice as our um, reason for being. And um, in most recent years, this has come to mean people who are most subject to marginalization and exclusion in the UK. And by that, I mean people who lack basic protective factors um, and as a result, expose them to continual and escalating harm. And there is a great phrase that was coined um, in 1971 uh, called the inverse care law, which dictates that those with the most uh, problems receive the least help. We observe this daily uh, in our work um, and has come to define uh, our focus. Um, 
And those people who are subject to those uh, harms um, then find themselves in institutions, mental health institutions, hostels, prisons, um, what the systems uh, thinker uh, John Seddon describes as failure demand. Uh, so people um, find themselves in those institutions with their uh, with facing even further harms. And so we have systems which are created to uh, address needs and harms which are actually shaping and escalating them. Um, philanthropy, which is a in the UK a, a tiny um, uh, margin of the of the money that is available uh, to address social harms, um, has a default mode and has for probably decades, which is to um, fund through a set of criteria projects organizations, uh, solutions, outcomes, and if we're feeling particularly good about those things, scale. Um, and all of this in the name of meeting needs. Um, not a great deal of attention focused on where those needs came from in the first place and why, um, but I will come on to that. So when I joined Lankelly Chase, I um, brought with me, a, and that was about 10 years ago, brought with me a frustration with this very reductive, in my view, way of, of looking at social justice as a process of meeting needs, um, and became interested in systems thinking um, from a very amateur perspective. It was only latterly that I um, um, uh, did the Open University courses. Um, and um, I had a number of rationale for why, um, why we should adopt a systems thinking approach, which I will um, um, uh, describe here, if I can uh, shift my, um, there we go, presentation. And I have post-rationalized this with open university um, language. So firstly, when you're looking at people most subject to marginalization and exclusion, there are, um, um, there's always a, uh, a boundary confusion that arises. Um, what is relevant to that situation seems infinitely expandable from socioeconomic inequalities through to media and public opinion, through to the laws of the land, to the commissioning and procurement of services uh, that are uh, attempting to remedy the problem, um, through to uh, the behavior and culture of incumbent institutions. So all sorts of things are at play and where we place our boundaries around that and what we consider relevance in our responses um, is ever shifting. And then of course there are multiple perspectives. Um, there are um, lived, learned and practice uh, ex uh, experience um, at, at play, uh, academic perspectives, policy making perspectives, frontline uh, lived experience, sectoral differences, how a situation is, uh, is, is conceived rather depends on whether you're in the homeless sector, the drug misuse sector, the mental health sector, and so on. And then there is interconnectedness, um, both between the harms experienced. If you have a, uh, if you're homeless, you're uh, more likely to have a drug problem. If you have a drug problem, you're more likely to have a mental health problem. And so it goes on. Um, and then there is interconnectedness between the risk and protective factors. If you grow up in poverty, you're more likely to be subject to neglect. If you experience neglect, you're more likely uh, to experience, to experience uh, drug misuse or homelessness later in life. Um, so there's no single explanation, uh, no cause and effect, which holds sufficiently to help us understand um, what we're dealing with. And so we've come to say that both positive and negative outcomes emerge from this whole complex interconnected picture, which leads to um, the final um, uh, reason for a systems approach, which is uncertainty. Beneath the veneer of our evidence bases and our impact reports, which we as organizations are forced to produce, lies deep uncertainty about what actually works. So this was our um, initial rationale for a systems approach but ultimately it is a rationale that has proved insufficient and overly intellectualized. Um, 
many people, both in the organization and around the organization, have hankered for a stronger rationale that ties a systems approach with social justice. There has been a sense that we have um, been uh, overdetermined by um, systems thinking and um, almost as an end in itself and have lost uh, um, um, a grounding in why all of this is important. And so lately, um, um, the answer to why a systems approach uh, has become because social injustice is systemic, um, which seems um, a little uh, more obvious. So beneath all of the complexity uh, described in the, uh, the four bullets above is a deeper truth, which is that social injustice is there for a reason. It's not um, an accident of a system that is designed to achieve the opposite. Um, the provenance of the quote, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it, it gets, turns out to be uh, disputed. So I haven't put that up there, but um, social injustice is, um, is the result of a system intended to produce social injustice. Um, and this has to be acknowledged in this work, um, not least because this is the experience of those who are subject to social injustice, that the world is a rigged system. Um, and so in moving from um, an entanglement in the complexity of boundaries and multiple perspectives and interconnectedness um, through to um, uh, social uh, justice, um, I have um, adapted, um, 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 right, oh, hang on a sec. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm missing a slide, not to worry. Um, I have, um, uh, I, the slide I was, I'm missing was an adaptation, this is a shame, of, um, of a model by Peter Senge, um, which has a loop from, um, uh, the, from the harms experienced by people through to crisis interventions, which is a reinforcing loop. Um, and what I was saying about, what I wanted to say about that is that 90% of our energy and time is uh, taken up with um, uh, trying to improve and wrestle with the complexity of crisis interventions and why they don't work. Um, and then there is a bigger loop uh, through between uh, social harms through to a just and sustainable world. And the reason um, why, um, why that loop exists is because the social harms are produced by, by socioeconomic inequality. And so if you, um, if you imagine um, um, that that loop is a, it has a very long time scale um, and there are great delays between um, a world becoming a more just and equitable state place and fewer social harms occurring, you can see why we are caught in this loop of, um, of, crisis, of crisis interventions, because we are drawn to the problem and are entangled in the problem um, and are struggling to step back and see um, that um, actually, even if we improved to our satisfaction, the crisis interventions, we would still be left with a world that was producing more and more of these harms because we live in an unequal and unjust world. Um, and so finding yourself caught in this complexity trap, as I, as I uh, describe it in the missing slide, sorry about that. Um, if you're caught in a trap, um, you have to find strategies for getting out of the trap, which is why we have um, become um, focus at Langkelly Chase on disruption, on disrupting patterns that keep us trapped in particular places. And I will come on to that. So um, in responding to this, we have been engaged in um, course correction. And what I mean by course correction is that um, firstly, we've moved from funding programs to action inquiries. So we were engaged in open grant making, um, set criteria 
leading to um, uh, assessment and, and distribution of funding, um, which was a very static and very reactive process. Um, we were also engaged in structured programs, um, which um, underpinned by a theory of change designed to produce a particular outcome, which were incredibly linear and uh, based on a set of false certainties. So action inquiry, or as the Open University describes it, systemic inquiry, allows us to evolve our understanding of the situation of concern, to adapt our approach, uh, to sense make, to observe patterns and to test and experiment. And so action inquiry has been a liberating framework within which we can go deeper and to use the uh, a phrase of a of a colleague of mine to follow the bouncing ball where it takes us. The second course correction that has disrupted the Lang Kelly Chase system has been a move from prod funding projects to investing in field building. Um, foundation, philanthropic foundations love to love to buy the fruit of the labor, but not necessarily invest in what allows that labor to happen in the first place. So we buy the fruit, we don't invest in the soil and the, the roots. Um, so rather than funding individual projects, Lankelly has been uh, investing in networks of interconnected actors in, the, in what enables people to come together and share and exchange and, and act collectively. We've been identifying those parts of, of, a, of a particular field which are under-resourced, most often those people who themselves are subject to injustice and who have lived experience of that, because uh, our contention is that any field is only as strong as its uh, weakest part. And if people are under-resourced to do the work, then that compromises the health of the whole field. Um, and we have been also focused on helping to grow missing architecture and infrastructure that enables people to act together. So what you realize when working in social uh, justice is that most of the organizations working in the field um, were established decades ago um, to a paradigm that we're trying to move on from, that people are carrying with them the baggage of, um, of the of the paradigm that, that set them up in the first place. We don't necessarily have the infrastructure and architecture to contend with 21st century understandings of the situation. And then finally, we've been investing in people's skills and practices, because again, we, um, those, um, the, the, the training and practices that are available to us are typically those that have um, enabled us to uh, deal with 20th, 20th century problems, not 21st century ones. And then um, the final course correction was to move from trying to meet needs and come up with solutions to focusing on the conditions for change. Um, and, um, and so um, we have been intentionally focusing on things like um, governance. Um, so um, how are decisions made? Um, by whom? With what evidence? Um, Knowledge, knowledge generation and ownership, whose knowledge is considered to be authoritative and legitimate, who interprets that knowledge, how is it used? And then finally, um, power. Um, how do um, power relationships determine um, the outcomes that, that we get? And we've been particularly focused on in, in when we've been working in place-based ways, we work in a number of places around the country. Um, looking at, and we've, we, um, some of the, the thinking from the Open University on critical social learning systems has been extremely helpful in helping us to uh, engage in a power analysis uh, between the various actors in local places to understand that what keeps things stuck and entrenched is power inequalities between various different people. Um, so those are the kinds of course corrections that we've, we've undertaken. Um, the question then arises is, does this necessarily take us closer to justice? Um, 
um, which in a sense begs the question for, for us as Lang Kelly Chase, um, are we a justice-based organization? Do we ourselves embody justice in our work? Which, asked, which required us to ask, well, what systems are we in? Um, now, um, there are three very obvious systems that Lang Kelly Chase is part of. Firstly, there is the charity system. In the UK, this is regulated to produce a very standardized understanding of what a charity should be, and most obviously a depoliticized understanding of public good. Um, and this has privileged a professional class of people who are brought in to govern uh, in order to meet the rigors of, of regulation, um, which then in turn um, determines the kind of activity that charity is involved in. Um, and those of you who know the UK will know that most recently charity has been the focus of, of culture wars where charities have tried to break out of some of the stifling paradigms that, that, um, that, it, that it sits within and have been um, subject to um, a, a political class's understanding of, of culture wars. So within our own organization, we have sought to disrupt our governance model by bringing in very different perspectives, people with very different kinds of experiences who um, don't necessarily um, uh, default to the charitable model as, as a way of bringing about change. The second system we are in is philanthropy, um, which is a model of largesse and benevolence um, that relies on inequality to sustain it. It relies on wealth accumulation as a means of, of enabling um, the, the, it, the philanthropic model. And again, those of you who are familiar with philanthropy will know that the troubling histories of some of that wealth have been exposed in, in recent years. Um, and so within Lang Kelly Chase and recognizing the, the problematic nature of, of, of philanthropy, we have sought to shift decision-making responsibility at, uh, out of the organization as much as possible into the hands of those who are trying to bring about the change. And then of course, there is the investment of our endowments, our own wealth. Um, we have been um, um, creaming off income um, from uh, investment in global capitalism um, while trying to address the externalities of that very same capitalism through our grant making. Um, so we've been um, using our position as an investor recently to be as disruptive as we can be on climate, on growth, uh, on uncolonial paradigms, uh, in order to, um, to address the, the paradoxes and tensions of our own situation. In all of these, we are recognizing that we are part of the system that we are trying to change. Um, we are moving to the new while operating within the old. Um, and as you can see, charity, philanthropy and investment are a 19th century capitalist paradigm that is alive and well today. And the question then is, can change really come from this paradigm? Um, so um, in the last couple of years, um, um, thanks to uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter protests, we have learned to view this as uh, an embodiment of white supremacy. Um, so again, an organization that is embodying in its DNA um, white supremacy is one that is going to have to act incredibly reflexively if it's going to move from um, paralysis to using its position to bring about change. And so we have endeavored to make as visible as possible our understanding of the, the paradoxes, tensions, and, um, and um, traps that sit within this paradigm and to disrupt them as much as we can. I'll swiftly move through the benefits of our course correction. Um, I would say that um, um, in adopting a more systemic approach, we've been able to see 
the hidden wiring more clearly that uh, creates a number of our social problems and stops people from acting in the way that they need to act. Um, and um, this has enabled us to be um, better allies to uh, the people that we fund and work with because we're more able to see um, the complex reality of their situation as much as possible through their eyes. We, are, we have um, a, a deeper appreciation of, of the dynamics that are afoot. Um, and then um, we have moved from um, moved to a focus on the health of the system and not on winners. Um, we're very alive to the fact that any funding criteria has winners and losers. Um, and it is inbuilt in a quite neoliberal model of, cap of, of, of philanthropy to focus on the uh, to focus on winners. Um, and so this move to focusing on the health of the system has meant that we've ended up funding very, very different profiles of people uh, over the years. Um, those who we believe are more able to contribute to the health of the whole. Um, and then and then fourthly, it has put us in the frame, as I say, from the previous slide, we are not neutral actors. Um, we are not detached from the situation. We are part of the situation. And that has allowed us not only to see the interconnectivity between our own actions and our mission, but also um, it has allowed others to um, understand the power that we embody, how we are trying to deal with that power, um, which has enabled more um, trust to, to arise. Um, fifthly, it's empowered the, the team to explore, not just do. Um, and so um, team members have, have pursued extraordinary lines of inquiry uh, in our work, um, not just cranking the grant making wheel, but, but really digging deeper and deeper into the, the situation that, that we're engaged with. And it's led to more realism about unresolvable tensions. Um, such as the tension between being the product of, um, of inequality and trying to address inequality in our mission, um, that um, we have become less reductive in our, in our attempt to work with those unresolvable tensions um, and have dealt with them as part of the reality of the situation that, that, that we're in. Um, there are, of course, issues with our course correction. Um, and this then perhaps goes to the heart of my presentation today. Um, firstly, um, messiness, um, which can sometimes feel like hot messiness. Um, that in trying to address social injustice systemically, we can end up with um, real confusion around, about the boundaries of our work, what is and isn't part of our work. And we have struggled continually to define that. We've also just struggled to define what level we're operating on. For those of you who know Donella Meadows um, leveraged points um, uh, essay, at any particular time, are we focused on which, which, which level of the system are, 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 we, are we focused on? Um, and we've, we've been often quite confused about, about that. Um, and these two things have then left, uh, led to us being often confused about our purpose um, because um, the, the, the process of action inquiry can be so unsettling um, that um, a team of people can collectively struggle to keep um, a focus on, on what our collective purpose is. Um, and what contributes to that is what I've described here as endless incrementalism. Um, that if we're in a continual state of adaptation and change and learning um, that is coming from different bits of the Lankelly Chase system or ecosystem, then um, it can often be hard to feel solid ground under your feet. Um, it can often be hard to keep in mind what are we aiming for um, and how does it all fit together. The, the coherence can be hard to, to get. Um, the next um, point about centering ourselves is to do with the fact that um, we as a funder who are also trying to be system practitioners can often be at risk 
of misusing our power, and as you see, I'm coming on to power, of misusing our power to pursue our own lines of inquiry um, um, so that others feel that they have to be part of Len Kelly Chase's action inquiries in order to access our money. And that often we will own that, and often we will be um, funding um, activity at the pace of our learning, not necessarily at the pace of the action that is needed out there. Um, so um, we are not consultants uh, or academics, we are funders. And if we take over literally the, the notion of the system practitioner, we can end up uh, positioning Lan Kelly Chase uh, at the center of, of things where we have no place being. Um, and then this kind of bleeds into exclusiveness. Um, a trustee of mine said recently that coming to a Lan Kelly Chase board meeting has been like prepping for an exam. Um, and it is certainly the case that we have ended up being caught up in quite exclusive language, quite exclusive models, um, which are understood by a particular group of people with a particular kind of education, a different kind of particular kind of experience, which has led to alienation, which has led to us not um, connecting with many of the people who, who need to be part of our work. Um, and it's also led to us erasing other understandings of systems and systems practice um, and, and you know, centering whiteness as, as, a, as, a, as a paradigm. And then finally, um, um, I should have, oh, under five, I was gonna write power, 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 because so much comes back to, um, uh, to this, which is, you know, as I started by saying, Social injustice is a product of an unequal, inequitable society. Lan Kelly Chase is itself a product of that dynamic. Um, and so we can find ourselves doing things like um, uh, imposing system change as a funding criteria um, um, and action inquiry, not, uh, not lightly held, but as a, a rather oppressive um, uh, mechanism by which people are forced to engage with us. Um, and so our funder status can risk continually reproducing and perpetuating privilege and inequality, even when we um, uh, are trying to, to do the opposite. Um, and this is my final last but one slide. Um, where are we now? Um, and I'd like to come to you with a, a neat conclusion because um, uh, a narrative arc to a, a, a clear destination point, but um, um, the timing of this presentation and the, and the clarity of a destination point have, have not uh, coincided. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, we have been overdetermined by um, uh, the, the mechanisms the, the language, the concepts of systems thinking. Um, and this has, um, this has caused us to lose some of the touchstones of our work. Um, and we, have, we are now trying to get back to them. So justice um, is, is, a, is a concept that we are currently uh, exploring in terms of what it means to our work. And I think some of the things that are coming out most clearly by, by justice are decision-making and framing. Who gets to shape, to determine the paradigm we are all working in? Um, and um, injustices, social injustices, are so often compounded by the good intentions of people who um, have not experienced those injustices, but who still think they're entitled to make the decisions and frame the debate and frame the action. Um, secondly, um, uh, trust, space and care. Um, to work systemically, we have to focus relentlessly on the quality and basis of our relationships with each other. Um, and as I say, power informs and infects most of what we do um, as does inequality. Um, and 
Um, and so we, ha we have to um, continue to be explicit about the terms on which we're engaging with each other if we're going to build trust. We've also got to invest in spaces for people to connect, dream, breathe together on their own terms away from sources of power like Glam Kelly Chase. Um, and um, we have to invest in care for people who are at most risk, who lack our protective factors. Um, because if we want people to do the work and those people are harmed and traumatized, then we have to invest in healing and care to enable people to be part of this. And then finally, there is um, a question about um, entanglement, um, that our systemic approach can draw us so deeply into an entanglement with trying to improve uh, the system that we can um, lose sight of um, the space for um, deeper work in which we dream about an alternative. Um, and again, most people who have lacked resources, uh, perhaps for generations, have never had the space to disentangle themselves from systems which are continually causing them harm and to imagine a world where of healing, of liberation, of justice. And so investing in um, processes uh, whereby people can disentangle and dream um, is, is becoming increasingly important to us. And I describe this at the end as action that reveals and disrupts, disrupts and or reimagines, builds and models. Um, and um, this is urgent work, but it's also deep and slow work. Um, and a funder like Glenn Kelly can help protect people's ability to imagine a world with no harm. Um, and um, because um, systems thinking likes, um, so, likes some provenance, um, I am concluding with a quote from uh, Donella Meadows, um, the, uh, the essay that I've already referenced, which is that systems folk would say you change paradigms by modeling the system, which takes you outside the system and forces you to see it whole. And um, so, th so this, is, this is the point that I want to finish on, which is that um, much of what we have struggled with, which um, uh, I'm sure Professor Eisen, um, well, I know he would say, because he said it to me the other day, is an issue with the design turn that um, we do or don't take in applying systems thinking. Um, much of what we've um, struggled with has been because we've become entangled um, in systems rather than using our independence and wealth to create spaces for people to model the alternative. Um, and so that, that is our direction of travel, um, uh, but not the destination that I'm finishing on today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julian. Um, I'll let you uh, catch your breath. Um, and I'll encourage anyone viewing who hasn't put a question they want to ask to put it up in the chat function. Uh, because we, uh, Barbara and I, have to uh, field the questions on your behalf. It's how this platform works. Julian, while uh, I uh, frame my first question to you, do you want to try and grab that slide that you didn't show and perhaps just put it up again or be in a position to put it up? Because that's been a question uh, that's come in on the uh, chat, chat question. But if it's not there, it doesn't matter. If it's going to take time, we can, uh, we can skip it. One second. How to derail your own presentation. No, no. Well, uh, <laughs> you described it very well, but uh, yeah, the, it was a specific request that I thought I'd uh, pursue. But if it's going to take your time, we don't have a lot. So uh, let's get on to some other questions. Um, one second. Um, do go on to other questions and I'll, um, I'll come to it. Well, I, I was going to... Um, 
You've mentioned power consistently uh, throughout your talk, uh, and it's uh, critical to the work you do. And um, what have you learned about power conceptually and pra practically? Can you give an exemplar where you may have contributed to transforming, diffusing, describing? What is the verb you would put in relation to power that has been most powerful for you? Um, probably the, there, 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 are, there are two um, examples that spring most immediately to mind. So one of which is the our, our play space work has um, uh, has been a, a process of um, uh, initially sharing power with people locally who are trying to bring about change and gradually um, um, shifting that power uh, towards um, uh, people who've been subject to marginalization. And um, um, again, we come up against the, the um, strictures of the, the, the Charity Commission in, what, in how much control we can genuinely um, uh, hand over to people while remaining accountable um, for our actions. Um, um, but um, we're now at a point where um, uh, locally, a lot of the decision making has shifted from Lane Kelly Chase and is being held by a group of people locally who are shaping their understanding of what's required and are moving resources around on our on our behalf. Um, and um, and so that sense of beholdenness to an external funder sitting outside of their local system uh, reduces. It doesn't disappear uh, because we can't, within the world that we inhabit, we can't disappear it. And the second uh, example has comes from um, what is recently being described as shifting from grant making to redistribution. And that is um, the notion that this is not our money. Um, this is money that happens to be in our organization for a, you know, for a, a number, a number of um, uh, historical quirks. That means that we happen to be sitting on top of, of wealth um, that has grown um, harmfully uh, for some um, or for many. And, um, and that actually, if we're going to disrupt the path dependency, that means that a huge amount of wealth is sitting in the hands of white majority uh, organizations, then um, a process of redistribution would help us to, again, to disrupt those paths. Um, and um, um, otherwise we are doomed to repeat the patterns uh, that have brought us to this point. So we are in the business at the moment of, ask, of asking ourselves, and I mean, I, um, I'm not actually at liberty to, to say today uh, what we're doing about it because it's, 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 in, it's in process, but of, um, of not viewing our endowment as inevitably ours, but actually sharing the, um, the resources and therefore the freedoms and ability to act and the power that comes with that endowment into other organizations as well. Thanks, Julian. I'm going to hand over to Barbara now, who's going to uh, field a few questions from the audience. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ray, and thanks very much, Julian. And now, now we have uh, very little time for just a few of the many questions that we have received. And already apologies that we will not be able to come to all of them. They're great questions. Um, so let's maybe start with one here from um, uh, from Lydia um, on Zoom. Um, there, uh, this is very much the case usually where the decisions about inequality are made at the top by people who have no lived experience of them, nor willing to engage with them, uh, with those who do. Lack of time, lack of budgets, etc., are always cited as obstacles. How does one approach? How does one approach it from uh, from the point of view of care and responsibility with senior management teams? Is that something you can respond to, Julian? Yeah, I mean, so this is this is why I I go back to the you know the, the paradigm shift that um, that systems thinking can make available to an organisation, uh, allowing it to connect much more with its mission and much less with the uh, the institutionalised norms that um, that causes to causes to think and act in in certain ways. So. Um, 
the privileging of of so the UK charitable norm um, privileges the, the the health and preservation of the organisation often at the cost of um, the lives and outcomes of those that those organisations seek to serve um, and um, in the case of philanthropy there is a mindset that one of the jobs of governance is to keep hold um, of the resources in order to maintain the health and status of that organization. If you reframe this as, um, well, your mission is to produce um, better outcomes in society. Okay, where do those outcomes come from? Um, that it comes from um, less, less inequality um, of income, power, status, um, et cetera. Then, um, then that tells you something about um, about what you should be investing your um, your time and money in. Not privileging the processes of your organisation, but actually looking deep into um, how can we put this money and this organisation at the service of those who uh, of of the health of the system. Um, and you know, so rather than thinking of 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 our wealth as our endowment starting to think of it as uh, the, the endowment of the mission um, and, and therefore um, a, a set of actions and decisions follows from that, which are not necessarily in, in the interests of Lang Kelly Chase, they're in the interests of, of the people that we, that we serve. And so um, hence trying to push decision making into different, into different places, which has disrupted the hierarchy within Lankelly Chase as well, because you need fewer senior decision makers and more people who are able to affect that, that shift. Um, so Lankelly itself has structurally changed um, because um, uh, we need less, uh, we need less decision making and power in, in invested in, in its seniority. You have another question there, Barbara, or do you? There, there are many, but maybe let's pick uh, one here from Philip on Zoom, um, uh, who's asking, he's curious to hear more about the basis and mechanisms of your systems of injustice. I find myself thinking about both wealth inequality and cultural problems among, e.g. the police. When you say systemic, are we talking about psychology, negligence or concerted effort? Well, um, I'm sure there are plenty of models that um, begin with the harms and then go to institutional practices and then go to social norms. Um, and this is what I was kind of saying about confusion about which level of system we might be operating in at any particular time. Um, um, we tend to get less caught up in um, uh, institutional behaviors um, and try to enable people to focus more on the social norms which are determining those behaviors in the first place. So we have gone from needs and harms to um, institutions that do or don't help or create those harms through to um, equipping people to uh, exploring the mindsets, attitudes and social norms that are, um, that, that are determining our, our institutions. Um, and of course, there is a, a line you know that goes through all of those things so many people you know we're, uh, most people are operating on multiple levels at the same time um, and their intervention in a social norm might be um, uh, uh, challenging uh, institutional behaviors and, and attitudes but the the, um, the goal is to is to shift the wider paradigm the wider and to enable people uh, who are trying to shift that wider paradigm to dream, reimagine and grow um, different institutional architecture that can then um, enshrine that paradigm in everyday behaviours. Um, and that's the bit where there is so little money available for people to be able to do that and to, do, to take risks and to do that over the long, uh, long haul and adapt and, and grow. And that's the bit that we wanna use our wealth to, we wanna under, use our wealth to underwrite the risk of people going on that journey. 
I've got two quick questions, perhaps, because we're getting out of time. Uh, what processes do you use to track your own institutional transformation? And the second one comes back to your uh, what you mentioned about use of systems language. Was it a systems language issue or is it uh, also a systems concept issue? And what was the nature of that? So the first one was, how do we... How do you track your own institutional transformation, your organizational transformation? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, about, we're, we're about to do that um, at, at our next organizational way day. Um, um, we, we, we go through processes of, of storytelling to reorientate ourselves back to moments of, of, of change to understand how that change has occurred and why. Because people joining our system um, don't necessarily have the backstory for why is the system behaving in this way? Um, and why, why are people taught using this language? And what is the origin of that? And so our trustees, for example, joined the board um, and rightly said, um, I can't I can't be part of this if I don't know why we're here and what choices you made, what you considered when making those choices, what you discounted, et cetera. So again, it's that kind of path dependency thing of um, any particular time that someone joins is a moment in, in time for us to um, re-describe and also just to remember um, some things that we'd forgotten uh, personally about why we, had, why we got to this point. Um, um, and to be honest about some of the messiness of it as well. Um, um, and then the second one was about, was that about exclusiveness and language? It was about, you mentioned the language problem and what was the nature of that problem? And was it only to do with the use of language or was it also to do with the use of concepts, systems concepts? Um, a bit of both. I mean, it's, um, um, I, I think that I was, very much at risk of, of, of being a, um, a systems thinking um, a dictionary, walking dictionary for a while, uh, because I was so overflowing with, with language and concepts that people were kind of saying, what the hell are you talking about? And even when I thought I was, wasn't doing it, I was, um, just, in, just in the way that I was ordering uh, my communication. And so, um, and I think, Possibly in your book, Ray, but there's there's a, there's a there's a kind of that bit about moving towards mastery, which is to say that you can start to wear this stuff lightly or more deeply um, because you're able to um, operate in a world on other people's terms and use these and use these concepts um, um, in a way that informs your actions rather than having to. Put it on the tin continually and say you know um and use terms like independency and emergence and complexity that has people thinking what's that got to do with my life and and, and my work um there is also the problem with power um that comes from a funding organization that says um uh, it starts to use this language, which then suddenly crops up uh, magically in people's funding applications. Um, so you find this language uh, reflected back to you, um, which is always a, a, a warning sign that you've, you've overstepped and you're starting to overdetermine uh, the situation that you're part of. Um, but I think um, conceptually, um, the, the, only, the only problem we've had conceptually is um, slightly flitting from flower to flower, picking models up, dropping them um, as we've learned. Um, and again, you know, that if you're in a powerful position institutionally, you can risk confusing people um, because today it's all about emergence and tomorrow it's, it, it, it's, um, it's about something else. And so, um, and then, um, and then just recognizing that the reason why you know about these things is because of a particular background. Other people have equally sophisticated, deep uh, systemic practices, which use completely different language. Um, and so that the need for dialogue between things um, 
becomes utterly crucial so that you don't erase other people's experiences or, or oppress other people's experiences. But that comes back to the thing about relationships and trust and so forth, that you've got to put the groundwork in in order to, in order to be in a room together, able to have that conversation in the first place. Thanks, Julian. I'm going to hand over to Barbara now, and I'm not sure whether we've got one more question or, and then a wrap up perhaps, but we're almost out of time. Um, I don't know if you can, oh, no. <laughs> oh dear, this is doom. I don't know if you can see this, does that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is the, what I described as the complexity trap. And this is the adaptation of the, the model from the fifth discipline, the Peter Senge one, which is where you see the kind of, the, and you know, this, this wouldn't score any, any marks in a, in an open university exam, but um, the loop between um, social harms and crisis responses, um, where as I say, 90% of our time is caught up, um, desperately trying to um, reduce the reinforcing nature of, of that loop um, and wrestling with the complexity of that. Um, whereas actually what's going to cause social harms ultimately to uh, wither on the vine is a more just and equitable uh, society. But the delays that exist um, in that loop are so, uh, are so long, uh, it's very hard to keep the vision and purpose there, not least because we want to respond day to day to harms. We want uh, to help people to live better lives. And so it seems to me that it, it is incumbent on um, ph philanthropy to um, create both spaces. To, for there to be a twin track and for that to be an intentional strategy. It's not an either or. And also those people who are seeing those harms are also those people who are dreaming of a more just and equitable society. So how you enable those people to, to be part of the, vi the visioning and the dreaming um, becomes crucial. Thanks, Julian. Barbara. Yeah, no, now we unfortunately are running you're very much out of time. We only have three minutes left. So apologies to everybody who has posted excellent questions, really thought-provoking questions. And we only wish we had had more time to field more questions, have really engaging discussions as well. So, but so thank you for everybody who posted great questions and and so apologies that we didn't get to it. And very much heartfelt thanks to Julian uh, for responding to this invitation uh, from uh, from Ray to come and share your your experience as a practitioner of the uh, bringing this uh, systems thinking in practice concepts um, uh, that you've engaged with at the Open Universities uh, uh, as a student of the STIP courses, same as myself and many on the on the uh, talk here today. I think this has resonated a lot for many of us and also looking at many of the comments, this definitely has resonated for many of us as fellow STIP practitioners and alumni from the OU STIP courses. So many thanks, Julian, for sharing your own personal experience of your journey, applying this very much in practice and it's really inspiring for, for a fellow, fellow uh, a practitioner to hear that from you as a really inspiring case study of, um, of how you can actually manage to apply this in real life, not just in a textbook as we have all read them, but you, know, you really shared with us and inspired us how this can actually be done in practice and how you, how you live life as an inquiry. Actually, that, that I take away from what you shared with us most of all that you actually really embedded these uh, these experiences and learnings in your own inquiries, your own in your own life and organizational life, and you have managed to actually uh, bring many of these concepts to life in your organization. And this I find very inspiring, as an, another organization bound <laughs> um, practitioner of um, STIP. So this is super exciting to actually. I think many of us will hold you now up as an example to to point to where it can actually where we can actually point to this this can work also transforming um, organizations uh, with systems um, approaches there would be many comments we could make and continue this conversation unfortunately we don't have half the time
time now. Um, so, so just uh, to then mention to everybody as we come to a close now in the next minute that um, this this was actually, as you many of you know, was has been the penultimate lecture for 2021 to commemorate the um, 50 years of systems thinking and practice teaching at the Open University. So this has been part of a series and many of you have been to many of the talks uh, in, as part of this series and this has been the penultimate in ultimate lecture today and the uh, year will come to a close in due course um, on the, so the next event, the final event for 2021 in this series will be the final lecture which will be given by Professor Ray Eisen as Professor of Systems at the Open University since 1994 and he will present um, his, his lecture on the Tuesday the 7th of December same time, same channels, so stay tuned and more information will be uh, issued shortly at the OS, OU STEM YouTube site and um, the links which um, have been posted here in the chat and will be uh, shared with everybody through normal channels. So uh, keep your eye on the <laughs> announcements to come. So uh, Ray will uh, give his um, final lecture there as the John Bishan Memorial Lecture um, and John Bishan was the first professor of systems at the Open University. Um, so he, 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 I suppose uh, Ray will re-engage uh, uh, with this uh, early, early start, early part, starting point of the OU and systems journey at the OU. So we look forward to that. And uh, for now, many, many thanks for Julian, to Julian for sharing this with us and for Ray and uh, to bring him, bring you here and for uh, all of you for fielding excellent questions and we wish we had more time and real discussion. And many thanks for the, to the OU um, STEM uh, team uh, who made this possible on Zoom, YouTube and Facebook. So thank you very much and see you again soon. Bye. <laughs>